<laughs> well, welcome, ladies, to um, our second session of the study of James. And, you know, inside of all of us is this thing that tells us that things aren't the way they should be, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know it, right? You see things in the world, in your community, in our own church. We had some have some had some news of some things in our own community here, and you just walk away from it going, you know, God, that's just not the way it's supposed to be. And uh, so it's what I call, I don't know if it's original to me, but that's what I always called it, an echo of Eden. That is, Eden, you know, when, when uh, God created the world, it's supposed to be full of flourishing and life and strength and energy and productivity and all of those things. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says it like this. It says, God has written eternity and set it in our hearts. That's what it says. So we know innate to us that this is not the way it should be. And so inside of you, there's this unconscious thing that is always looking for the source of what right really is. And uh, this yearning steers and guides and directs us, whether you realize it or not, because you're always searching for this place of life and uh, and uh, energy and growth and the way it should be. And so, um, you know, whatever you think, whatever you are convinced in your heart will give you that source of life. It's what is directing and steering the way you go, and you'll go after that, whatever it is. So as unbelievers, people who jettison the whole idea of God, they just are making it up on their own. And you see the crazy things that people uh, come up with that they think is going to give them this life. And it might be uh, drugs or alcohol or materialism, money, relationship after relationship after relationship, that they are looking for this thing that will give them and satisfy what's deep down in our hearts. For believers, um, you know, hopefully that um, you have... Now, try a lot of things in your past, maybe, but you are convinced now that you've uh, lived long enough, tried enough things, and you are convinced, hopefully, that um, walking in union with God is the way to find that life, and, and that you are committed to holiness and committed to following Him. And I certainly hope that that is the way that you are thinking, but it might be that you're a believer, and you've decided that you trust God with most things. But this one area of your life over here, you're not really sure. And so it kind of pushes you to find life in a different direction um, in that one specific area. And this week we're moving on with our second lesson in the, in the book of James. And remember that this all goes together. It's not broken up into sections where they're, they, they're unrelated. So last week we talked about trials, right? And uh, trials are common to everybody. And we spent the whole time talking in main group and in our small groups about uh, how we can benefit if we respond correctly to those trials. That is to be build endurance and perseverance and spiritual maturity. That if we respond correctly to what God is doing, that he will bring good out of that. But then we looked at two real uh, battles and we said we need a reset in our mind about when it comes to uh, doubt. We talked about what double-mindedness was and about how we're blown all around. And then the other thing in verses 9 to 11, we talked about that tendency within us when something goes wrong in, that we are uh, tend to compare with other people. Now, God, why are you not, why are you doing this to me and not to them? And we look at, look at them and to look out there and compare ourselves. Or the other thing is to take things in the world and wrap them around us like that's our security and uh, we uh, begin boasting in those things. And today, we're gonna look at the third struggle we have to fight during trials and that's what we're the, today's set passage is all about and that's temptation. And uh, within every trial, when we unmask temptation, we learn that within every trial there's this hidden temptation. Okay, uh, like if you have a financial trial, you might be you're going to be tempted to distrust God's provision. If your trial is in waiting, you can be tempted to doubt God's involvement in in your your situation. If it's a health issue, you can be tempted to distrust God's love for you. Or even in prosperity itself, can be a trial of, of sorts to lean on material things and to make them your security and not God. So within every trial, there is a hidden temptation, and 
So, but what James tells us in this passage is that God sends trials, but he never sends temptation. And so uh, temptation is a result of desire. Not all desires are not evil or bad. In fact, if we, uh, our desires can be wonderful things that God gives us, that keeps us moving forward in life, helps us to follow his will. Uh, but our, when our desires get off track and we get deceived about where the source of life really comes from, then they become our worst enemies and they lead us away from God because in our quest for life and prosperity and wholeness, deceived desires point us in the wrong direction. So James comes straight in with verse 13 and he says, straight up, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt anyone. So here James warns us right off the bat, we shouldn't bl ever blame God uh, because this is where we can take a trial that's sent by God to build us up and to encourage us in the long run and build spiritual maturity and lead us toward, um, well, like he said, early on in verses 2 to 4, that we won't be lacking anything when we respond correctly. But we take that trial that's intended for building us up and turn it into a res sinful response when we accuse him. And the, the language here in the original is really strong here. So what he's saying here is, don't you dare say that God is tempting you. So it's just a rebuke of them. And you say, because God doesn't tempt anyone. Temptation never comes from him Ever. But he goes on in verse 14 and tells us where it does come from. He says, from, But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Now, we go all the way back to the beginning of the story that we have in the Bible. Knowing what we know about what happened in the Garden of Eden, you might expect, James would say, but each one is tempted when Satan leads him away, drags him away, and entices us. But that's not what that verse says. Uh, because it um, doesn't mean Satan's not involved in temptation because we've got a whole lot of other verses that talked about his, him being the great deceiver and that he is a lion looking for somebody to destroy. And so he is, he is going to work hard at offering things to us that lead us away from God. And James even talks about the devil, uh, resisting the devil in chapter 4, we'll get to in a little while. But even so, he says the responsibility for sin and temptation lies squarely on us. And so we have no one else to blame for our sin ultimately but ourselves. And so now, nobody really wants to talk about that too much, right? So today, the world is basically giving us a free pass to blame everybody else for our sin and everybody else for the things that are wrong in our lives, except us, right? I mean, it's not your fault, the way you were raised. It was other people had better opportunities than you did, and it's because of what he did or she did or what they kept you from doing. And uh, we hear that me message so much in the world today that even believers are tempted to believe it and respond that way. But uh, we know that this is not a new thing. Our, our, our culture didn't come up with this idea that to blame other people. All the way back in the garden, Eve blamed the serpent, uh, Adam blamed Eve, and he also blamed, blamed God. So the reality is that, though, that God gave them the, the, cho the, the ability to choose. He gave them the power to choose, so the fault was ultimately theirs, even though somebody offered them the serpent, and Satan came along and offered them something else. They had the power to say no. And so the point of the whole, the whole point of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden was that everybody gets a choice. God's not going to force you to follow him. He wants you to choose to follow him. So that's the point. What so it was there, so you get to for us today, you get the choice to obey and follow or to disobey and ignore. And um so, yes, the world, the devil, they are going to incite and inflame your desires and get you looking at all the wrong things. And, but honestly, for, for believers in Jesus, we need to be willing to take the hard look at our own selves and own up to our responsibility for the sins that we choose to be involved in. And so we don't, we don't want really want that uh, responsibility too much. In fact, we are magnificent in our ability to justify just about all anything. I mean, have you ever heard somebody say, 
to you say, I've just got a piece about something, right? I've just got a piece about this. And then they go on to describe this thing that is so opposite of what God would say in his word. You're going, what? <laughs> you know, it doesn't even make any sense. But I will remind you that you do not have peace disobeying God. If you're a believer, you don't have peace. You have, um, you have, you have justified, you have deadened yourself to listening to the spirit of God. But let's look at what Romans chapter eight, verse six says. So the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. That means walking in the spirit is the only way to find life and peace. It's the only way, because if we're doing something opposite of what God tells us to do, then we deprive ourselves of peace, deprive ourselves of life, and begin to walk toward destruction and death every single time. That's what the Bible says to us. So um, we choose opposite of what God says. We become so deluded by our own desires that we have blocked out our, the ability to hear the Spirit say to us, this is the way, walk ye in it. And this is why we must continually bring our desires, our plans, our ideas, all these things under the light of the Word of God. Because we can become so deluded that we don't can't make good decisions on our own. But that's why God gave us the spirit that lives within us and the word of God so we don't have to guess. It's written down for you. Look and see what it says and bring those desires underneath what he has already said. And so be regardless what our feelings tell us, regardless what uh, logical, rational reasoning that the world would say that is, um, say to you... Uh, it doesn't have to make sense from an earthly standpoint. God is never wrong, and he does not give bad gifts. We have to learn to yield to him to keep ourselves off the road of destruction and toward death. Now, yes, there are all the time, there are three tempters that are working in concert together, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they are going to lure you away, but you have to own responsibility for your own choices. The devil can whisper in your ear, the world can show you all kinds of things that make you want, this, this is going to make you happier, this is going to make you joyful, this is going to make give you everything that you want, but ultimately, the decision to act on those impulses is yours 100%. So the devil cannot make a believer sin. They can't, he cannot make you do it. He can offer you all kinds of things, but the Bible says the Holy Spirit within you is greater than he who is offering you all of those things. So when we choose to take the devil's uh, suggestions, it's we who ultimately have decided to yield to those sinful desires and at the same time, we also have the ability to turn our back on those things and walk toward God. Now, you have to remember that the longer that, and more consistently that you, that you have yielded to a path that is toward sin and away from God, the harder it is to resist. But you can always choose right. And if you have uh, set a pattern in your life that is away from God in one particular area in your life, you can choose today. You can start today by by choosing to say, I'm going to follow God and not this anymore. So um, back to uh, verse 15, James goes on and tells us what it looks like to yield to temptation. Verse 14 again, he, each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has, has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to to death. Now, normally, we as human beings are repulsed by death and attracted to life. So the only way to be attracted to sin that ultimately leads to death that James tells us here um, is through, the first one is through deception. There are four steps in this path of sin. The first one is deception. So think about commercials on TV. You know, you see uh, out Alcohol, you know, the, the ads for beer or for wine or whatever, alcohol. Now, what kind of people and what kind of parties do those look like, right? They are beautiful people. They are dressed up in beautiful gowns or they're having a great time at the football game or whatever it is. You never see at the end of the commercial a twisted, mangled car that has run into a tree somewhere or hit somebody, some other innocent people. We would be re repulsed by that that picture and so we wouldn't be drawn to it at all or if you think about we just finished up christmas 
Think about the Lexus ads, right? Uh, you got that picture where the spouse surprises their 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 uh, their their husband or wife with this brand new SUV with a great big bow on it, and with, on, out in front of this beautiful house with snow covered uh, driveway and everything, and they're all excited, right? And this year there was one where they bought a, a, a his and hers version, and the only thing that they were arguing over was who gets which one, right? <laughs> Remember that one, right? Right. It's like, but. If my husband drove up with a new Lexus in the front yard and said, Merry Christmas, that's not what would happen. <laughs> I would not be excited because I looked up online how much a Lexus SUV is. $80,000. $80,000, right? I mean, it's like, can you imagine for your average normal person out here for a husband or a wife to go out and make that kind of irresponsible purchase uh, and bring it home? What would that do to your finances? What would that do to the arguments that heated up in your house? <laughs> I mean, okay, this is not the beautiful picture that you're going to see on the commercial, right? No. <laughs> and so, um, so the way to make any idea that actually is bad is to cover up the truth with deception, right? And so that creates then evil desire at, that, that James says in verse 14. So sin begins with disordered thought. That is, it's covered up by this deception. It's not real than what you're seeing. So, and then it leads to disordered desires that make us want things that are really deadly. And so think of deception and desire working together kind of like a fishing lure. Um, you know, uh, so, so the only purpose of the bait is deception, right? It's to, to, to make that, uh, that, that fish think he's getting something good when what he's really getting is death, right? That's exactly, they don't bite on an empty hook, and neither do you. You don't bite on an empty hook. So some temptation is not a big deal, right? You don't have any problem with resisting some things, right? You're, that's because you're not deceived about them, so you don't desire them, okay? I mean, if I walked into a store and there was a clerk there counting money and they turned it back for a minute, I'm not going to grab that money. I'm not going to be tempted to grab the money and run for the exit, right? I might go, well, that was really foolish to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to be grab it even if I, you know, had a need for money. Because I've watched too many crime shows. And there are too many cameras everywhere. <laughs> right? Because I know that the source of life, that's not going to give me joy. It's not ultimately going to give me joy. I'm not going to make it to the, to the exit before somebody stops me. Right? So I'm not deceived about that. There's too much fear, too many repercussions, too many cameras. And I know that stealing the money is not ultimately a source of happiness. So there's no desire for that. It would lead to terrible consequences. Now, something else like holding a grudge or blaring back in anger at somebody, I might be more willing to take that kind of bait, right? Because it seems like that might be the way to satisfaction, at least in the short term, right? I mean, it's like, hey, she can't say that to me. I'm gonna give her a piece of my, my mind. Or, you know, how could he do that? I'm gonna hold a grudge against them because it feels like maybe that would be the way for me to get what I really want. That is, I'm going to make them hurt or I'm going to just tell them how I feel. But what does the Bible say? Anger ruins relationships. Anger is destructive. So is holding resentment and hostility, but it's maybe not quite so obvious, right? I mean, so it seems... Uh, so, so it doesn't seem important to consider that in the moment because I just want to react. Um, so, so some t temptations are easy to recognize because you're not deceived about them, and others we are. Uh, so temptations that you struggle with, whatever they are, the ones that are hard for you are the ones that your soul is deceived about. Think about that for a minute. Your mind can read the Bible, you can understand it, you can have conversation, but your flesh is not convinced. It's not. Because once you begin to reason that committing this sin or doing this thing that's opposite of what God says might actually lead you to something good through, through this thing, um, you're deceived into seeing it as a pathway to happiness. Even if God says no. So once your desires get tricked into believing that it's the way to something good, then the temptation 
is almost impossible to resist. Okay, so so there's this thing, back to the fishing lure example, there's this thing dancing out there, and it's sparkling, it's shiny, it looks really good and interesting, and so you swim up just to take a look. But the more you have, you ha you, uh, time you look at it and think about it and mull it over and come up with it, you know, eh, it's not so bad, but God would really be upset if I did that. And the more you think about it, the harder it is not to take it. Or you may think about it. Sometimes you see the thing dancing there. You don't think about it at all. You walk up and just say, grab it. And you do it on impulse. You have a deceived thought. Hey, that looks good. You grab it. And you don't even think about what the consequences are at all. So how do you change your, your thinking about whatever's out there that, that tempts you over and over again? How do you not be deceived? Well, okay, so now I love the little mini M&Ms, right? The little bitty ones, not the, not the great big ones, but the little bitty ones in that little container. And if you give me one of those, they are going to be gone in a microsecond. I, mean, I just love those little crunchy little things. Anyway. So, so, but if I had, had them and hold them in my hand and everything, you said, hey, but you know what? Five of those are poison. They have so much poison in it, you're probably not going to make it into that. There's only five of them. I'm not going to eat want those at all. I'm not going to want any of them. And now what is that? What happened to my desire for the many M&Ms? I understood that there's a poison there. And so I, when I, once I understood that and I'm alerted to the danger of it, then my desire goes away. Right? So that's what happens because you begin to know the truth and you believe the truth and then the desire dissipates. So step one in changing your desire for that sin is to be reminded of the poison that's really there. And that's exactly what, uh, what James does in verse 15. He says, desires conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. And so what he is doing, he's pulling the bait away from the temptation and exposing the hook. He says, with all the barbs, we can see exactly what happens to us if we bite down on that temptation. Now, this is a graphic picture of what happens when we give in to our desires and take that bait of temptation. So we have these evils and desires enticing us. And if we don't stop there, which at that point we can, if we take the bait and grab hold of it, then we lead to the fourth thing, which is disobedience. That's when we actually act on what we want to do. And so this picture here, back to, to, back to verse 15, is um, a picture of conception and birth of a baby. It's conceived, it's birth to sin, sin full grown, birth to death. death. So, but it, this has a, not the joy that uh, a mother would have anticipating the, um, the arrival of her baby and how much happiness she's going to get from that. This is a stillbirth, that the baby is born, brings forth death. And so uh, grabbing hold of that temptation to do anything outside the clear teaching of, will, uh, of God will not end in happiness and joy. It's going to end in death. And that's the last part of it is death. The fourth step of this pathway to sin is death. And so what, it's always that. Always that. And um, so, so James in verse 16 gives us a, a really quick warning. He says, don't be deceived my dear brothers and my dear brothers is us Christians. He's saying, don't be deceived about what you're looking out there at temptation. Don't be deceived by the lie. Don't be deceived by the bait. Pay attention. Um, he, it's because he says temptation is to, by its very nature deceptive. And so we look at this good option over here, but when we connect it back to what he said about death here, we see that if we take it, it's going to crumble in your hands. It absolutely will. And in contrast, he goes on to say at the, the back half of this is that there are good, good things out there. There are good gifts out there, uh, but they won't end in death. And the source of the things don't come from inside of us, don't come from the world, don't come from the devil, but they come from God. And what he gives doesn't disappoint. It doesn't end in regret. And I, I'm sure every single one of us could take our turn standing up here and give an example of us saying, hey, you know what? I took the bait of temptation and I went in that direction and it wasn't very long till I went, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't 
gone in that direction. I wish I had to do over on that one because I would choose differently now that I arrived there and see what is actually out there that's not a source of life, it actually end in death. And God warns us and warns us and warns us through scripture and through teaching and through counsel of friends and through the gentle voice of the spirit. He said, don't go after that stuff. Don't do it. Don't be deceived. Embrace what God has to offer you that will not disappoint. Uh, so you don't have to have, understand how it all turns out. It doesn't have to make sense to you. It might be the absolute opposite of what your feelings are telling you on the inside. Choose to obey anyway. Because that's the direction toward life, not what temptation is offering you. So three things we need to be conv convinced of uh, in the last two verses here to help, about God to help us unmask temptation. The first one is we need to see God as the source of all good. Verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And uh, really, Father of lights really means Father of creation. Kind of kicks us back to Genesis chapter 1, where we see him speaking everything into existence and with all power, bringing forth all that we can know and see and experience. And um, so we will never have success in fighting our temptations until we stop looking at God as simply a source of good. So God is not just one of the sources of good. God is not even the best source of good. Mm. God is the only source of good. And victory over sin comes when we are fully convinced that he is the only source of good. Okay? Yeah, and we talked a little bit about, back in Ephesians, about common grace. That is, common grace is the things that God gives all of us, everybody, whether we follow him or not. I mean, how many good gifts are in this world? I mean, <laughs> let's just start. Food, that's God's idea. Uh, sleep. That's from God. Um, how about uh, if anybody enjoyed a little bit of the snow? That's from God. That was his idea. Laughter, rivers, mountains, oceans, beaches. All has his idea. The sun, the moon, the star came from his eye, came from his mind, gives to us generously, gives us, you know, family and children, and their men and women and husbands and wives and parents. All his idea. Common grace given to everybody. And you know what? What kind of amazing God gives, drinks up wonderful stuff like that and then gives them to a race of humanity that blaspheme him and spit in his face every single day? Mm -hmm. That is the kind of generous, loving, good God that we get, that, that he is. This is who he is. He is the source of all good. And pours it out on us over and over and over and over again. And so uh, if you want to fight temptation to do something, that temptation to do something opposite of what he tells you, think about the source of all that you have. There's not anything that you have that didn't come from him. Don't look at the bait. Look at the reality of all that he's been so generous to offer to you. Look up to the one who gives you everything that you have. And don't say no to him. Say yes to him. Say, I love you. Thank you so much. And don't turn your back on him. Turn toward him. Try Psalm uh, 121. I, where does my help come from? I look my eyes to the hills. My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Think about that. Now, this isn't to say that you're going to get everything the way you want it, but he is good, and, 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 and he is going to give us good things that are good for us. Sometimes we want things that are not good for us, right? I mean, amen. Anybody prayed for something? And you're like, I am so glad he did not give me that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I look back and I went, whoo, thank you. Because <laughs> we interpret sometimes even the bad things that we think are bad. We go back to last week's things that we interpret are bad. God is using to work spiritual maturity in our lives. And that's a good thing. And so um, whether we even understand it at the time or not. So uh, we need to, to, to need to understand that God is the source of all good. We also need to believe that God never changes. Look at the back half of verse 17. 
Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And uh, if you like the King James Version, uh, that's no shadow of turning is what he says there. And you've heard that in the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Uh, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father. Uh, there is, there is no shadow, shadow of turning, turning with thee. thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. And so we understand that he doesn't ever change. And that, that there is no shadow of uh, churning comes from this verse right here, straight out of scripture. And it's, uh, once again, throws us back to God as being the creator of the heavens. And um, if you think about it, okay, this is, you know, I'm a homeschooled mom. Uh, <laughs> and I, I never get past that. So you're going to get a third grade um, a science lesson here. So you know when you were in little, little science class that you know the sun always shines, right? Sun always shines. It's like it never changes. Um, it's you know it's always putting out its light. It never diminishes. Always the same. So now when darkness falls on the earth, it's not because the sun changes, right? Is it? Sun change. Sun's always the same. What happens when darkness falls? The earth has turned away from the light. That's what's happened. Okay, the earth is turned away from the light. So when you give in to the darkness of temptation, it's not because he's changed. It's because you have chosen to turn away from the light. And that's the point of this whole section on temptation here. Our lusts capture our attention. And they cause us to stop looking at the source of light who never changes. And we begin to turn away from God and turn toward our own dark desires. And that's what he's saying here. Temptation loses its appeal when we begin to understand that he never changes. His word is reliable. What he did to said 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago or whatever is just as valid as if he said it yesterday. It, he does not shift. He does not change. And you can act upon what you read in Scripture. It's mine. <laughs> it's my purse. Just, just swipe it off. <laughs> it's probably spam. Sorry. <laughs> so you can act on what you read in Scripture with complete confidence. Doesn't mean, again, it's always going to work out the way you want it to. Uh, but he is, he is the source of all that is right and the only source of what is good. And the last thing as we wrap up here, we need to understand to unmask temptation is to embrace God as a giver of life. And uh, we talked about this just a little bit. Like I said at the beginning, we are always searching, whether we realize it or not, we're searching for the, the place of life. We're searching toward where we can find that life. But, but we have to be convinced that he's, He only life resides in Him. Verse 18, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he creates. So that first part right there says the birth here is talking about salvation, okay? And you know that he's not talking to unbelievers because he says us. James is talking to believers who are who used to be Jews. Remember last week that have become Christians now? So he's not talking to unbelievers. So he is talking to us about the new birth that comes through the word of truth. That is, you heard the gospel message, all of us who heard the gospel message, and uh, we embraced it. I, I put our trust in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and became saved as J Jesus said to Nicodemus we were born again into the family of God like in uh, John chapter 3 so here's what we need to understand with that this is the way a pastor I like to listen to says it he says God knew what he was buying when he purchased you through the blood of Christ God knew what he was buying Okay? He is not surprised. He knows all your shortcomings, all your faults, every time you're given into temptation, all your fa failures, and he chose you anyway. Okay, He's not mad at you. He doesn't look at you with disgust or disappointment, or he's not upset when he sees you. He doesn't say, oops, I know she was going to do that. Maybe I'll choose somebody different. I should have picked somebody different. That's not what he's doing. Verse 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. He chose to do that. 
Uh, he didn't have to. Nobody forced him to do that. But he looked down through the corridors of time, and he said, before you were ever born, before you were ever thought of, before your parents, 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 parents were born, and says, I choose her. I choose her. And so before the foundation of the world, go back to Ephesians chapter 1, read it again if you forgot from that. Remind yourself of these truths because um, he chose you, knows everything about everything, even the stuff you haven't done yet. He already knows perfectly all of that stuff. Psalm 139 says before you say something, he knows what words are before you even come up near him. He knows you that completely. And he says from way back then, I chose her. So what makes you think that what you did yesterday, today, tomorrow, two weeks from now, two years from now, ten years from now is going to make him change his mind? He did it. He's done to change his mind. He knows what he bought when he purchased you through Christ's blood at Calvary. Okay? So everything you have, because uh, everything from that point of his choosing, which is before time began, is all that you've done is future to that decision. Okay? Remember that. Uh, if you have areas that you need to work on, like we all do, if you've given into temptation even a lot, uh, um, or have a long history of dealing with some particular sins, don't let that be a source of shame, okay? It's not to say that God's okay with you just living wherever, any way you want to. We need to move toward repentance. And that is necessary. And holiness is what we strive for. Don't forget what verse 15 says about the consequences of choosing a sinful lifestyle, which is death. Don't forget that. But we need to deal with our areas where we fall short. And we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to push us to, to walk in godliness. But um, where we've taken the bait, we need to turn around from that. But we need to know that God is always ready to forgive, redeem, and restore. Okay, last half here. He says that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he has created. Now, that's a reference to first fruits as an Old Testament re reference uh, that these Jewish believers that he was writing to would understand immediately. But we kind of have a disconnect with that, so we don't. Let me unpack it for just a second. Um, <clears throat> this reference is a requirement that Israel was given to bring the first fruits, uh, the first portion of their crops, to the temple as a thank offering to God. So they got the first thing that of their crops, they bring them and say, and effectively what they were saying is that we acknowledge that God, you are the source of all that we have. And at the same time saying, this is just a portion of what's coming. There's a whole lot more coming after. That's what first fruits are. And so it says, God, in this verse, he says that we are God's first fruits. So what he's saying here is that we are expected to bear more fruit after us. Okay, so if you're living for yourself, if you're thinking about only to find life and fulfillment in this world, then um, and you're spending your time and your money and energy trying to make a way the best you can and make it comfortable and happy, your focus is not on God. James wants you to realize that if God has given you new, new, new life, you are his first fruits. And you belong to him. And the restoration and the change that he is working in your lives right now are, are, are a reminder to us that there's more to come. That God is showing that what he's redeeming in us right now, changing us, is that's a hint toward what he's doing to come throughout the rest of the universe. So that's a picture of what he's doing in us. It's what he's going to do with the rest of of the world. So we're like a little signpost as he changes us from image, from, from sin into his image. It's, it's a little signpost to people say, hey, you know what God said he's going to do? It's going to happen. I'm a picture of what he's already done. The rest of what he says is true as well. So spiritually, he's made all things new in your life the moment you gave Christ your, your life. So and then practically, he is re leading you every day into more holiness. And eternally, he's giving us a foretaste of the new heavens and the new earth to come. Mm -hmm. That's what James is saying right there. And so, um, as you walk in holiness, as you experience this redemption, it becomes a demonstration of the, to the rest of the world that he's going to redeem everything. Else. So especially in trials, in our doubt, in our 
tendency toward comparison. And like we learned today in our temptation, our aim should to be respond to his voice, bear fruit for him through godliness and through obedience. And so we bring glory to his name. So we're in the Old Testament with this last. I'll, I'll end with Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. God says, this, is, this day I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. This is exactly what James says. We always have the choice between life and death. Follow God or follow temptation. This is what he's saying. He says, but he calls to us through the word of God, through other people, through the scriptures. Choose life. So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, God, thank you so much that you don't leave us where we are. Thank you so much that you give us the tools to fight temptation through your spirit within us, through <coughs> scripture, through our, our godly people around us. God, give us the wisdom to hear your voice when you say, this is the way, walk in it. And we thank you that, um, that you have redeemed us and, and that you continue to redeem us in our choices every day and that you are God, always true to your word and that you will bring redemption and wholeness to this world one day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.